She's a leading member of the Communist Party of India, <coughs> Marxist Leninist, and the editor of its monthly publication, Liberation. She's also the National Secretary of the All India Progressive Women's Alliance. She was a key and strong voice in the mass anti-rape movement, which followed the horrific 2012 Delhi gang rape. So, welcome. Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, I will try and keep my remarks also as uh, concise and to the point as Sadhpal's uh, uh, was, and it was. Uh, I'm glad that I'm speaking uh, to sort of give you an idea of what's going on in India now. Of course, caste in India is a very big story and. Uh, Actually, you can't talk about it only in terms of, obviously, you can't talk about it only in terms of our current government there or the Hindu, uh, uh, you know, Hindu majoritarian ideology and so on. But uh, because it's a short talk, I think uh, I'll try and keep my remarks to what's happening right now with uh, some uh, developments in India right now. You might have uh, heard that, for instance, uh, the uh, you know the poster you see here, which says "Justice for Rohit." Uh, this is one incident that has uh, um, brought caste once again to the political forefront as an issue that is disrupting certain kinds of narrative about uh, India as moving towards development and a certain kind of neoliberal development. And it's also something that is disrupting the narrative of a of a resurgent Hindu India that is, uh, you know, that is represented by its current prime minister. So, uh, uh, Rohit, as you might know, is a, uh, as many of you might know, was a young uh, Dalit uh, scholar. He was a young uh, student in a university in India, at the Hyderabad Central University, and he was also a committed Ambedkarite uh, leftist activist. So uh, he described himself in those terms as someone who believed in, uh, you know, Ambedkar's dictum to educate and agitate and organize. And uh, he was therefore also organizing very strongly against Hindu right-wing student groups and uh, so on, as well as on a range of other uh, political and social issues. And he was at, uh, in what has become a pattern, you know, it's become a pattern in uh, the last couple of years of this new government in India to uh, <coughs> brand people as anti-national, those who are dissenting voices against the government or against the Hindu right-wing groups. And uh, Rohit in particular and uh, four others of his organization were victims of this because they were branded as anti-national and uh, the, the Hindu right-wing student group in their university uh, falsely accused them of having indulged in violence against them. Uh, in actual fact, uh, the ABVP activist uh, who made the complaint had suffered appendicitis, but he claimed that he, was, he had been hospitalized because there was a clash with Rohit and his friends and he'd been beaten up. And then he, uh, based on his complaint, central government ministers got into the act, wrote letter after letter, uh, one of them wrote a letter to the HR, the Human Resource Development Ministry, and then that, uh, saying that this, uh, these students are casteist and national. It's very interesting because if you're an Ambedkarite activist, you know, there, that is the one place in which the Hindu right-wing groups are willing to use the word casteist for you. So you're not casteist if you're talking about caste supremacy of, uh, you know, uh, dominant caste groups, but you are casteist if you are, uh, you know, talking about uh, Dalits organizing for their rights. So he was branded as casteist and anti-national and so on. And he was expelled from, he and his friends were expelled from the university. And during an agitation to be taken back, he committed suicide tragically, leaving a very, very powerful, poignant kind of note about how the fatal accident of his birth and how he, uh, uh, you know, about his, about how, uh, it, you know, the, the idea that the discrimination that went with being Dalit was something which wouldn't let you go. And um, so uh, after that, the Modi government actually faced a whole lot of, uh, and it's very interesting how they've dealt with that situation because that, it, the movement after that was, has been extremely, uh, extremely inspiring in many ways. Because for one thing, it was a student movement which uh, made a huge political impact. And it then went beyond being a student movement alone. 
and that has not happened in India in very recent times for a long time. I mean, it was a remarkable student movement, and also it uh, it managed to uh, open up the it, it showed w what is happening alive on the ground, where there's a new liveliness around Ambedkarite activism <coughs> as well as uh, left activism, an interesting uh, you know sort of conversation among various kinds of such activism, and s that's being seen in a whole lot of places, especially among. Uh, young people and how the government responded to this is quite telling because I think they uh, you know they, they uh, especially uh, you know their central their central ministers also responded by trying to suggest because some of their people were were uh, being uh, charged under the prevention of atrocities act which uh, India has a legislation to prevent atrocities against uh, uh, Dalits that uh, in order to avoid, uh, in order to claim that charges cannot be brought under that act, they claimed that uh, Rohit was not Dalit at all. And it's interesting mm. because uh, they did so, uh, for a long time the Prime Minister was completely <coughs> silent on this, uh, and eventually when he did speak at a, at a convocation at a uh, <coughs> and Bikka University, he did so after some students actually raised slogans against him. Uh, saying, uh, directly talking about Rohit and about caste discrimination and asking him to break his silence. And the students were evicted from there. But after that, when he spoke, he uh, tried to say that, uh, well, let's not get into the politics around the death, but the death is very tragic and this is a son of Mother India, <coughs> Ma Bharti Ka Beta. So the, uh, you know, the wording is also, it's, uh, it's Mother India, but it's a specific way of saying Mother India that the RSS has, the uh, right, Hindu right-wing groups have Mahabharati. But the thing is that it's at one, at, at, you know, the, while the Prime Minister was trying to say this is a son of Mother India, at the same time there was a concerted effort by his ministers as well as the Hindu right-wing organizations, and you can see a whole lot of that on social media as well, trying to deny the <coughs> fact that he was his mother's son. Because Rohit's father is not uh, Dalit, Rohit's father is from an uh, other, other backward caste. And uh, in fact, what came out was a very tragic backstory, which about his mother's struggle as a Dalit woman, because she was someone who was, uh, uh, for want of a better word, adopted as a young, uh, uh, as a baby, uh, into a family, into some uh, by by, an, uh, by a woman who was from an o OBC caste, and uh, she took this uh, girl who was a laborer's daughter. But uh, in her in the in the new house also she was brought up more or less as a servant. I mean she was not brought up on par with the other children in the household. So she was adopted. Uh, you know, in uh, it was a it was a strange kind of situation. But uh, she was married into someone of the OBC caste without revealing to her husband her caste origins. Five years into the marriage, after several children were born, somebody told the husband that this is a woman who was a Dalit. Uh, is a Dalit, and he then, uh, who he was already abusive, and he abandoned the mother and all the, uh, his wife and children, and uh, <coughs> precisely because he said he'd been tricked into marrying somebody f who was an untouchable. So, in fact, if anything, this story brought out in many, and then she brought up her children uh, alone, single-handed. She, uh, you know, and uh, Rohit had very often written about his mother's uh, struggles to bring them up and his mother's labor. So, in a sense, by you know, you're calling him son of Mother India. But by suggesting that he's not Dalit because his father is not Dalit, it was a complete denial of the fact of his mother's, uh, his mother's uh, struggle. And in any case, I mean, apart from the moral and ethical uh, charge of this whole uh, story and what it tells us, it's also legally uh, very much the established case in India that uh, if uh, you are, I mean, you can avail of, uh, you know, you can uh, even avail of uh, uh, reservations and affirmative action under, uh, un, uh, you know, as a Dalit. If you, uh, even if your father may be, may not be Dalit, if uh, you know you are able to establish that you were brought up by your mother, and there are so many instances of Dalit women being abandoned by uh, you know uh, uh, partners who are non-Dalit, so uh, the Supreme Court of India has taken that into account. So I said that in some detail because this is something I think it was about the uh, Sangh Parivar, the uh, uh, the Hindu right wing group speaking in with a forked tongue but sort of unable to, uh, you know, folk time works when you can't see the folk, <laughs> but it's, it was uh, kind of completely obvious that they didn't know which register to speak in about this instance, about this whole matter. 
and uh, so they were falling back into uh, continuously insisting that there was nothing wrong here and that he wasn't a Dalit and that nothing wrong had happened and that's happened more recently in Indian Parliament as well um, and uh, uh, while I say this I should uh, I should also recall that you know the, the Prime Minister has tried to position himself as being someone from an oppressed caste who has made it so he's often tried to position and this is also something I notice as being uh, something the uh, you know the, the Hindu right-wing uh, leaders try to tend to do. He has said this about himself in political discourse. You see, he was shunned by a whole lot of political. I mean, he was a sort of person on ungrata politically for a long time because of his uh, role in a massacre of Muslims in 2002 when he was the chief minister of Gujarat. But he would try to imply in his rise to become prime minister that he was being treated as an untouchable, that he was being a, treated as a political untouchable, and more recently. Uh, you see, this pattern of what happened with Rohit has been repeated in other places as well. Even before uh, what happened to Rohit, there was an attempt in the IIT Madras to put a ban on an Ambedkar Periyar student organization that did not succeed. And after uh, this incident in Jain, in the Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi, it's almost the same pattern where students were accused of being anti-national for protesting the death penalty to convicted terrorists and in JNU's case for taking up the issue of Kashmir and uh, you know the, uh, the hanging of Afzal Guru and uh, the students were accused of being anti-national uh, by the ABVP and then uh, uh, BJP MP came into the picture filed cases of sedition against these students uh, most of whom are from very uh, poor backgrounds and many of whom are either Dalit or Bahujan in, uh, in terms of their <coughs> origin and have had quite a struggle. Some of them are first generation graduates who have made it to university through quite a bit of, uh, from, uh, quite a bit of struggle. So these, uh, this pattern is of what happened with Rohit is something which is being repeated, you know, this thing about calling people anti-national and then uh, getting, them, uh, getting them thrown out. But it's interesting that even in that instance, I just uh, noticed a couple of days back that the, the ABVP, uh, which is the Hindu right-wing student outfit of the, of, of the BJP, they have, a, you know, uh, in the JNU Students' Union, one post is, has been won by them. So they're, they're the joint secretaries from the ABVP. So in the movement that has since then uh, emerged uh, around JNU, it's a huge movement and you know the whole of JNU and far beyond JNU. So there have been a lot of uh, connections also between the HCU, between the movement for justice for Rohit as well as the movement uh, you know, uh, standing up for JNU. So for the JNU students, that movement uh, is a huge one. Now this joint secretary has been writing about how he has been, he's been telling the media about how he has been sidelined and he's not being consulted by the union, although he's an elected union representative. <coughs> he's Saurabh Sharma. And in saying so, he said, I'm being treated as an untouchable. I'm being treated like a Dalit. And you know, I think that's really uh, of, of a, a, a sort of uh, uh, very telling about the instrumental way in which uh, you know, uh, this, uh, this whole thing is seen, that you can deny Rohit's being <coughs> a Dalit uh, in the face of all, uh, you know, all the uh, mm, uh, 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 kind of damning evidence of how he has been discriminated against as a Dalit and yet you can use this analogy and this term so easily so lightly uh, in order to uh, you know uh, justify your uh, uh, you know your position politically um, one of the things which I also wanted to mention about uh, just tell me when uh, if I'm going to have a few minutes left you have yes, a few so minutes, yeah. yeah so when uh, when uh, Narendra Modi wrote an article some time back, uh, some years back, about uh, it was a sort of hagiography of the RSS, one of the RSS founders, Guru Golwalkar. So when he wrote about Golwalkar, you can see the, the English translation is available online, and uh, it was translated from the Gujarati. So before he spoke about Golwalkar, he names a whole lot of people whom he sees as uh, you know history's great great men of history. Not surprisingly, all men, but great great you know, people <laughs> in history. And uh, when he talks about Ambedkar there, it's very interesting because he refers to Ambedkar as the modern Manu. Now this is Ambedkar who burnt the Manu Smriti <laughs> as, the, as the fountainhead of uh, the discrimination, caste and gender discrimination. Uh, but uh, 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 um, Modi himself uses Ambedkar as an alibi. He did so in, uh, uh, in Britain as well when he was here and asked questions. If he's asked questions about 
uh, uh, you know, uh, communal violence or intolerance in India, then he can refer to Ambedkar and refer to refer to the constitution <coughs> that Ambedkar drafted in order to say everything is all is well in India. The point is that what we are witnessing now is an all-out attack on the constitution. <coughs> and in the context of what happened in January, just a, uh, a couple of things which I want to mention before I wind up and before we can discuss. One of them is that, you know, uh, one of the things they've been <coughs> saying, the ABVP raised the slogan to the students who organized uh, uh, an event uh, to remember Afzal Guru and uh, to talk about, uh, you know, Kashmir, uh, self-determination Kashmir. So there they, they raised the slogan, Jo Afzal ki baat karega, wo Afzal ki maut marega. Those who talk about Afzal Guru, who was, uh, many believe, wrongfully convicted, uh, uh, and uh, uh, there's been a strong criticism of the verdict which convicted him and the manner in which he was hanged by the previous government. So to say, if you speak about Afzal, you will be killed as Afzal was killed. Now, the thing is that uh, they've been, uh, 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 what, what has emerged since then is that it's not just about, only about, if you speak about Afzal, you will be attacked. Because a JNU professor, Professor Vivek Kumar, had gone to Gwalior to give a talk about Ambedkar's, uh, uh, you know, the uh, India of Ambedkar's dreams. And he was attacked by the uh, Bharti Janta Yuva Morcha, which is the youth organization, youth wing of the BJP. <coughs> and they attacked him and they fired at him and they tore copies of the constitution there. So uh, this is not uh, just by the by. What is being witnessed now is an all-out attack on uh, con the constitution and on democratic rights. And there's a special animus to, there's of course an attempt to appropriate what Ambedkar stands for. But there's also a you know, special animus to, uh, you know, uh, the challenge that uh, 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 these ideas might pose to Hindu uh, supremacist ideology. And one of the things I'd like to say in the context of this whole anti-national tag is uh, even about the way in which the media looks at these things. That if you organize an event on Kashmir and if you talk about self-determination for Kashmir, then uh, certain sections of the media can go berserk saying this is anti-national. And yet when uh, sometime back, a few months ago, uh, something emerged, there was a sting operation by the Cobra Post, you can read it online, those of you who would want to, uh, with, which spoke to pe perpetrators of massacres of Dalits in the 1990s in Bihar. So these are people who have completely escaped conviction. Some of them have been acquitted by the Patna High Court. There was, a, there was a series of massacres by a banned outfit called the Ranveer Sena. So it was a sort of private militia, landlord's <coughs> private militia. And they were attacking Dalits who had actually or, uh, organized as uh, this, uh, around the CPIML and they had uh, and other left groups in Bihar. Mm -hmm. And they were massacred very brutally in Bihar. And these people on, uh, were caught on camera op quite openly boasting about having conducted the massacres. So, so there's a certain kind of performance and boast there where they would talk about the details and how they did it and how they did it because how dare these people organized to demand dignity or demand land or demand wages and so on and so forth. So uh, they also talked about how they were funded by various very senior people in the BJP hierarchy. So they had uh, funding from the BJP. Uh, they had protect political protection by many, lead many political leaders, including many of those in the BJP. So when this was discussed, you never had a discussion around uh, is this not, you know, even if one talks in terms of anti-national, if there is any such, you know, if that term can have any meaning at all, what does it mean uh, to be able, you know, if you're going to talk about terrorism, why is this not a certain uh, form of terrorism, the fact that you conduct Dalit massacres? And yet the head of the Ranveer Sena uh, was described, you know, after he, he, was, he was killed some time back, after, at his funeral, BJP, senior BJP leaders described him as the Gandhi of Bihar, someone who conducted Dalit massacres. So this was not seen as a glorification of terrorism. But to say that the death penalty to Afzal Guru was wrong, the conviction for Yaqub Mehman was wrong, these, for these Rohit or the JNU students are being branded as anti-national. So I won't, I think I've finished up my time. So I'll it's just end, want to yeah. continue I'll just end with one minutes. thing to say that, you know, it's all, I think uh, uh, what is happening with the, the movement now is I think also that uh, it is beginning to uh, open up areas of activism 
and uh, forms of activism which are also disturbing some kinds of uh, caste politics in India and the way in which it has been articulated in the past. For instance, in, uh, in Bihar itself, after these revelations of the Ranbir Sena and all of that, uh, you know, the Bihar elections also showed that in, to some extent that uh, certain forms of uh, <coughs> politics which, which seemed as though you could have you know, uh, those leaders uh, who strike to project themselves as Dalit leaders and yet did business with the BJP, supported the BJP, were part of the alliance with the BJP, uh, did not do very well in the elections. Whereas, uh, you know, groups that had kept, uh, even including, uh, including the CPIML, that had kept these issues alive, actually did better, uh, uh, had talked about the Dalit massacres and uh, not allowed history to forget them, not allowed them, that whole history to be rewritten. Similarly, now, in the movement you're seeing now, I think there is a, a, a very uh, live uh, space now where, uh, you know, the possibility of an emergence of a new kind of uh, political dynamics and political voice uh, which can, uh, you know, which can uh, forge uh, unities with a variety of other movements, people's movements as well, and actually pose a challenge to the manner in which uh, 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 a, a Hindu majoritarian, uh, you know, the regime and, is, and the pro-corporate regime in India is trying to function. I think that's a, it's quite an exciting mm -hmm. time, although it's also such a challenging time. Great.